guys, this is Caesar with Nursing School Made Easy. Today's lecture is going to focus on acromegaly. And again, these are all um, lectures focused on helping you pass that NCLEX exam. So let's get right to it again. We're focusing on acromegaly. And acromegaly is simply an increased secretion of growth hormone. And that is secreted by your pituitary gland, your the quote-unquote master gland. Okay, so again, this is increase in growth hormone secretion and let's just break it down growth hormone growth hormone is going to make you grow okay it's going to come into play here shortly um, again it is due to an increase in growth hormone secretion and typically it is caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland make sure you know that for the NCLEX exam um, so the pituitary gland in the brain again is uh, excreting larger amounts of growth hormones and again that is typically due to some type of tumor now here I have Popeye down because uh, that character is supposed to have acromegaly and if you can remember uh, that cartoon character he's got really really large forms a very very distinct and prominent chin so these uh, patients typically have very distinct facial features they also have very very large hands very very large feet because again they have increased amounts or increased secretion of growth hormone now in children since the growth plates have not sealed completely they can suffer from something called gigantism they, they become giants they become really really tall because they have again increased uh, secretion of growth hormone which allows them to grow very very tall especially since those growth plates have not sealed so yes they do have the potential to become quote unquote giants. Now, again, this is typically due to a pituitary tumor, and sometimes that can be benign. In, however, we're going to focus on middle aged adults in this lecture since they do not have those uh, growth plates available. Typically, what will happen with these patients is they will have a thickened bone structure. Um, so let's get into some clinical manifestations that these uh, middle-aged adults will go through or will suffer from. Now, the um, disease process typically occurs over a span of maybe seven to nine years. It is not a um, something that you can notice from uh, excuse me one day to the next. Again, it typically takes about seven to nine years uh, for the clinical manifestations to be fully noticed. So again, um, patients might not realize that these changes are occurring. And one of the changes that will typically occur, a few of the changes, is an increase in hand and feet size. So are they using larger shoe, si excuse me, shoe size than they were several years back? Their glove size has it changed. Their hat size has it changed. So make sure you check those questions when you see those on the NCLEX exam anything that asks for maybe change in hat size change in suit uh, excuse me shoe size change in glove size maybe that question is leaning towards acromegaly now we talked about how again because the growth plates are sealed their bones can no longer grow they can't get any taller however because that bone is uh, has to grow due to the growth hormone their bones will become thickened this growing of bone this thickening of bone will cause joint pain again um, the growth hormone is going to want to elongate it's going to want to make uh, bones longer but since they can't get any longer they just become thickened and that will cause joint pain Or, again, we talked about Popeye, how he had some very, very distinct facial features. So with these patients, um, there may be increase in size in lips, nose, and enlargement of the face and head. Now, something else that can become large is a tongue. Now, you have to worry about the increase in tongue size because if it gets to becoming very very large then these patients 
do have problems with breathing, especially when they fall asleep. So you can run into some respiratory problems. And another problem that you'll run into is their vocal cords may actually change again due to the um, increase in size. So you may end up with a deepening of voice. So again, these are going to be gradual changes. So you'll ask him, have you noticed any changes with your voice? Any problems with sleeping at night? Your skin will be leathery. Again, we talked about how they're going to have a thickened bone structure. Well, their skin will also become thickened and it will become very, very leathery. In women, they will suffer from menstrual disturbances, menstrual problems. Now, think about it again. The pituitary gland is inside the brain. And again, you can only have so much expansion inside the brain. So if there is a tumor there and that tumor does become larger it's going to begin to cause pressure so a lot of these patients complain of headaches and also depending on how big that tumor is and its exact location it may cause some visual disturbances now Let's break down again growth hormone. Growth hormone is supposed to make you uh, grow. It's supposed to help you grow. So one of the things that growth hormone does is it releases fat into the body. Because again, you use fat as energy and typically if you're going to be growing you're going to be using or expanding more energy so your body needs an energy source and a good energy source is fat so you have increased uh, fat in your body in your circulation and if you have that well then this predisposes you or makes it more likely for you to suffer from something like atherosclerosis or a hardening of your arteries. So this, again, makes it more likely for these patients to suffer from some type of cardiac issue. Um, maybe some hypertrophy. Maybe some uh, heart failure later on. Makes it more likely for them to suffer a heart attack. Okay, so this is down the road, of course. Now another thing that this increase in growth hormone uh, secretion causes is hyperglycemia. So you want to check uh, sugar levels. Now again if this continues and if this is a chronic problem and that does not get treated, well then this patient does run the potential of becoming diabetic. So again you always want to make sure you check those sugar levels and also remember with diabetes you have um, your polydipsia polyuria polyphagia so you would ask that patient have you been voiding a lot are you thirsty um, are you always hungry again you would assess that patient for signs of diabetes Now, what are some diagnostic studies? There's a couple here that really, really set acromegaly apart from anything else. The number one thing that you want to focus on, make sure you know these for your NCLEX, is something called insulin-like growth factor. Okay, again, insulin-like growth factor. You're going to check your serum levels, your plasma levels, again, for insulin-like growth factors. So if you see insulin-like growth factor on an NCLEX exam, 
start thinking acromegaly, okay? Because in acromegaly, the levels of insulin-like growth factor will be elevated. So you will check that. That would be one diagnostic study that you will look at. Number two will be something called an oral glucose tolerance test. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take two baseline glucose levels before you do the exam. Again, you're going to take two baseline glucose levels. And once you have those two baseline glucose levels, then you're going to have that patient um, You have that patient take 75 to 100 grams of oral glucose. Now what's going to happen is you're going to check the growth hormone levels at 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. Now what's supposed to happen is, in a normal patient, when you give glucose, that glucose is supposed to make growth hormone levels decrease, okay? So again, in normal patients, what you would do is anytime you ingest glucose, your levels of growth hormone should decrease. In patients who suffer from acromegaly, however, if you do this, they're growth hormone levels will not decrease, which is why, again, you check it at 30, 60, 90, and 120, because you want to see if these growth hormone levels are decreasing. And if they are not, well, then, again, that lets you know that it may be something like acromegaly. Okay, so this is very, very specific to acromegaly. The first one that we talked about was insulin, like growth factor. Okay, and this would be, you check the serum for this. Another thing that you would do would be something like a CT or an MRI. And here you would use these to check to see if there's a mass in the brain, if there's a tumor. Now, what are some interventions for your patients? Again, it's good that you know what acromegaly is, but more specifically, what would you do for these patients? Now, remember that the overall goal um, for your patient that suffers from acromegaly is to bring those hormone levels, more specifically growth hormone levels, down to a normal level. That is our goal for, again, our patients, to bring that growth hormone level to a normal level. Now, if this is due to a tumor, you can do some type of surgery. You want to get rid of that tumor. And the surgery of choice is something called a transsphenoidal approach. Again, transpenoidal approach. This is surgery. Okay. And I'm going to draw. A, so this would be eyes. This would be nose. Mouth. Here you'd have brain. And here in the cella tercica would lie your pituitary gland. So this would be mouth. And here we have an ear. Okay, so a transpenoidal approach, what it really is, is they'll come in through the nasal area, through the nose, come in and take the pituitary gland out, pretty much. Okay, now this may be a complete removal of, of excuse me, a complete removal of the pituitary gland. Now remember that the pituitary gland um, controls a lot of hormones. It is a master gland. So if the pituitary gland is removed completely, then you must know that that patient will require hormone replacement therapy for life. Number 
two. Again, one thing that can be done is the surgery to remove the pituitary gland. And that surgery is called the transpenoidal uh, approach to removing the pituitary gland. Something else that can be done if surgery is not an option is radiation therapy. And this would be in hopes of decreasing that tumor size. Now, if neither surgery or radiation therapy um, can be done, then something like drug therapy can be done. And the drugs that you can use would be something like octreotide. Make sure you know this for the NCLEX, octreotide, or also known as sandostatin. Now this is a subcutaneous injection. And again, this is given in hopes of decreasing growth hormone levels. Again, octreotide is a subcutaneous injection and this is given three times per week. You can give octreotide or you can give something else called sandostatin. L-A-R or lanreotide S-R now the difference between these and the first is that these are intramuscular injections and these may be given every two to four weeks okay so here we have one therapy given every two to four weeks and octreotide is given three times per week. Okay, so there's a big difference in how often you give it. So again, here are some choices for your patient. Number four on our interventions. Uh, <clears throat> again, you're gonna ask your patient about any increases in hat size, ring size, glove size, shoe size. Um, if they have surgery, however, they're post-op, you want to make sure that you elevate head of bed to 30 degrees. Now this is going to prevent pressure on the brain. It's going to decrease headaches. Okay, because a very, very common complication of a transpenoidal surgery to remove the pituitary gland is a headache. So again, you're gonna elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees. You're gonna leave them in that position again to prevent or decrease uh, intracranial pressure and to decrease headaches. Now, again, we're focusing on intracranial pressure. We again, do not want to do anything that's going to increase that intracranial pressure. Now you want to avoid coughing, sneezing, you definitely want to avoid constipation because if you have constipation you're going to increase the likelihood of straining anytime you have a BM. So again, you want to make sure you keep your patient hydrated, um, good fiber diet, so, so again you prevent constipation. Again, try to prevent coughing and sneezing again because anytime they cough or sneeze they're going to increase their intracranial pressure and you're gonna make it more likely for that patient to maybe suffer from some type of uh, bleed in the brain. So that leads me to number seven, you're always going to assess nasal drip for clear fluid. And if you do see any type of clear fluid from the nose, you always want to assess that fluid. You wanna check for sugar levels of that clear fluid because you want to make sure that it is not cerebral spinal fluid. Because if there is a cerebral spinal fluid leak, that makes it more likely for that patient to suffer from meningitis. So if there is some type of clear fluid um, coming out of the nose, turns out it is cerebral spinal fluid, then you're gonna to wanna to prevent meningitis. So typically you will also give something like antibiotic therapy. And again, that will be up to the physician.
Now, another thing that you're going to have your patient do is avoid um, toothbrushing for at least 10 days. They just had surgery in this area, so you want to make sure that you do not injure that area. So you will want to avoid toothbrushing. You don't want those uh, stitches, sutures, whatever they use to come off. Because again, that would cause the likelihood of uh, brain bleeding to occur. Now, again, we talked about how they're going to have a headache. Okay, So you want to ask, where is that pain? And you want to make sure that, again, um, it says for headache, and more specifically, something called a supraorbital headache. Because that is most likely indicative of some type of brain bleed, OK? so. If you see this on the NCLEX exact exam, that's what it's referring to, some type of eye pain. Again, that's due to that increased pressure due to possibly some bleeding occurring. Number 11, I'm going to monitor for diabetes insipidus. Again, this is if you removed or if the physician removed the pituitary gland completely because remember that the pituitary gland secretes antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so you would assess for diabetes insipidus. You would al always monitor their urine output. Are they having large amounts of urine output? The other thing that you would look at is their serum and urine osmolarity. Now we're going to talk about those in a different lecture when we talk about diabetes insipidus. But again, make sure that you assess for um, serum and urine osmolarity and that you monitor their urine output.